You are about to hear a story suggested by actual events, so that no innocent person shall suffer. Names and places have been changed. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers bring you a story transcribed from the front pages of our great metropolitan newspapers. A story taken from life. Tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents Mr. Gregory Peck, who's going to tell you the truth about Jerry Baxter. A story of juvenile use of narcotics in the United States today. Hey, uh, Hap, do you remember starting your car engine by a hand crank? I sure do, Harlow. I worked like a horse. Well, you'd work like three horses to start today's modern engines, Hap. But now electricity does it and other jobs like running your heater, radio, lights, and horn. Electricity's pretty important to a car, eh? It's vital, Hap. And that's where Autolite comes in. Because Autolite designs and builds complete electrical systems used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. Why, my car is Autolite equipped, Harlow. And that means all the Autolite units, including the coil, distributor, generator, starting motor, and their thousands of component parts, are related by Autolite engineering design and manufacturing skill. Sort of a family team, eh, Harlow? Right, Hap. A family team working together to give you the smoothest performance money can buy. So, friends, take a tip from me and insist on Autolite, original factory parts, when your Autolite-equipped car needs replacements. Because only Autolite, original factory parts, can assure you the balance and perfect timing built into your car's Autolite electrical system right on the assembly line. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now with the truth about Jerry Baxter and the performance of Mr. Gregory Peck, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. your fault. Go on, call them. Let them know. Shut up. I've got the gun. If they come in this room, I'll kill you. You make a sound, I'll kill you. I'm just down the hall now. You know they'll come in here. Come on, kid. Do as I say. It's too hot. I can't breathe. Open the door. Oh. No, don't get me. Don't get me. Give me the gun. Look at your head. Oh. Oh. I warned you. I warned you. Oh, I gotta kill them all. I will. I will. I gotta get her out. I gotta get her out. There was a lot of pain and a sick feeling. I could hear him crying, and I knew that I had to try and do something before he started shooting. That would be the end. Then sounds faded away, and I remembered everything that happened as if it was a dream, only it wasn't a dream. It happened all right. With Jerry, it started at home. A mother and father who didn't have time, who didn't care. Next, in high school, smoking a smoke that wasn't a cigarette. Then, keep up with the gang until it was costing him nearly $50 a day to escape reality for a few hours. It was all in your newspapers a few weeks ago. How they arrested Jerry Baxter and sent him to a correction school for peddling narcotics in the high school yard. That was only the beginning. I'm a juvenile investigator, state of California, but this could have happened in any state. My name, McIntyre. I know Jerry better than his parents, which is bad. I got talking to him in correction school and asked him to tell me what happened after he'd been arrested. I want to talk about it. Why not, Jerry? Because it's like remembering what happens when you die. That's what it's like when all of a sudden they don't let you have this stuff. Well, I want to know, Jerry. What do you want to know? That you, you go nuts? They, they tie you down because you want to kill anybody? Yourself! 
You want to try it for six months, then see what happens when you can't get any more? You were 16 when you started using narcotics, weren't you? Yeah. When did you start peddling? When I didn't have enough money to buy any more. A fellow in high school put me on to someone. I got all I wanted by selling marijuana to the kids. Well, that's when they arrested you? Yeah. You got into a fight here a few months ago. Yeah. Do you want to tell me? Don't kid me that, you know. Well, I'd like to hear your side. Why did you fight? The other kid was getting out. He kept talking about it. Sent me crazy, I guess. So you beat him up? No. He had a knife and I got cut. They sent me to the infirmary. They treat you all right there? I guess so. I don't know. Why don't they let me alone? Let you alone? Who? Everybody. Just let me alone. I haven't been able to locate your family, Jerry. Neither have I. They threw me out of the house two years ago, and I haven't seen them since. Have you tried? Did you look? Ah, who needs them? He told me a lot more, and I got to know him well. That's when I was sure that this was a sick kid, not an habitual criminal. But he'd learned to hate. It was in his face, his manner. It was a furious hate, the stuff killing is made of. That's what I wanted to stop. So I took him before the parole board. I've been telling these people about you, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McIntyre feels that yours is a special case, Jerry. The fact that you gave evidence against the man who supplied you with narcotics, even though we couldn't prove anything against him, uh, still, it's in your favor. So? However, uh, we feel you should know that we don't altogether agree with Mr. McIntyre. Your record here hasn't been very promising. So let's get it over with. <clears throat> The recommendation has been made that you be released from correction school. Now, if we grant a parole, Mr. McIntyre has arranged for you to work in a department store in Oakland. I didn't ask a favor. In view of the boy's attitude, Mr. McIntyre... Yeah, I know. He's got a chip. But isn't that enough for you to see what I meant in my report? We have a responsibility to the citizen, to the community. I don't say the boy's incorrigible. Then give him a chance. You know the background. He's lived with punishments all his life. More of it won't cure anything. Let's try a little understanding and kindness. Very well, Mr. McIntyre. The board will make its decision this afternoon. Jerry Baxter was released the following week, and after being warned about association with former friends, was given $50 to get to Oakland and rent a room. I arranged a weekly report date with him and gave him $20 more for luck. He left the correction school at 10.30, and five minutes later was in the worst trouble he'd ever found in his life. Get in. Thanks. <clears throat> Going as far as Oakland? Sure. Swell. <laughs> Saves me bus fare. You, uh, live in Oakland? I got a job there. I used to live in San Francisco. Big hop across the bay. Yeah. Do you mind driving fast? No, I don't mind. I'm in a hurry. Okay with me. Jerry sat in the car and tried to watch the countryside flashing by. He didn't want to look at the woman. He said that. She was pretty, well-dressed, wearing a reddish fur coat. He knew she had plenty of money. It would have been easy to make her stop the car, put her out, and take whatever she had. It would have been easy. But he didn't do it. Just sat. That's what he said he did. Well, we'll be in Oakland in a couple of more miles. I'm going to stop at the drugstore in the next corner. Make a phone call, okay? All right with me. Gee, parking's getting awful. Look at that. Hey, there's a place right outside the store. Oh, no, that's no good. It's fire plug. Oh, that's all right. I won't be a minute. You slide over behind the wheel. You can drive, can't you? Uh, uh, sure, but I... It's okay. If you get a ticket, it's on me. I'll be right back. He was alone in the car. The keys were in the ignition. It would have been easy. If he ever thought of doing it, that was the time. But he didn't think of it. He said he didn't. He was just sitting there, waiting for her to come out, when the squad car came around the corner and stopped. Two patrolmen got out. Oh, are you parked, son? Yeah. How about moving it? Look, I don't see no fires. There's no place else in the block. It's just for a minute. Better move it anyway. Uh, 
Call it. This your car? Ah, oh, some dame in the store making a call. How come you're driving? I'm not. She asked me to sit behind the wheel. Stolen? Yeah. Better get out, kid. What for? I haven't done anything. Come on. I tell you, it's not mine. Ask her. She's right in the drugstore. Uh, red fur coat and yellow hair. Ask her. What's your name? Jerry Baxter. Where do you live? I'm in Oakland. Address? Yeah, I haven't got one yet. I got a job. But listen. What do you got? Glove compartment. Loaded 38 in this package. That, that ain't mine. I never even seen it. Sure. Hey... This is for the narcotic squad. What is this? That stuff belongs to her. Why don't you go in the store and get her? I was only hitching a ride. I don't know anything Take about... Take a look. Okay. Look, give me a break, will you? She picked me up. I don't know about a gunner or that stuff. Uh-huh. Okay, let's go. Find her? Manager didn't see any woman in a fur coat come in. She went in there. I tell you, she did. You come with me. Mel, you drive this car. Right. I brought Jerry into Oakland and locked him up. They kept him there all night. I was notified, and the next morning was in the office with two detectives when they brought him in. Mr. McIntyre. How do you feel, Jerry? Sit down. I, I didn't do it. I, I didn't. Maybe you didn't. But they locked me up. They didn't give me a chance. You'll get a chance. Have you seen this gun before? Oh, I guess so. It was in the car. I told you. Narcotics, too? Just in the car? Yeah. What about this woman, Jerry? I don't know. She didn't say her name. I was hitching a ride, and she picked me up on my way to Oakland. Why didn't you take the bus? Oh, maybe because, like you said, I was on my own. I was free. Anyhow, I thought I'd save a couple of bucks. You didn't tell the officers yesterday you were just out of correction school. Okay, I didn't. Look, we know it was a stolen car. We find narcotics and a gun. Didn't take you long to get back to peddling, did it? I'm not. I didn't. It was the woman. She, she had a, a red fur coat and blue shoes and yellow hair. Why don't you look for her? Where were you taking it? Who sold it to you? Jerry? I'm not lying, Mr. McIntyre. But I got a record. They won't believe me. If you're telling the truth, I'll believe you. Lock him up. We'll check his story. You're going to lock me up? I'll take it easy, Jerry. Easy? You ever been locked up? I got to find that woman. She framed me. You gotta let me find her. She'll tell you. I... I'll try. I'll do what I can. Yeah, and I rot. You got me. That's all you want. No sense talking to him. Come on. You're not locking me up again. No, no. Jerry. Get back. Put the gun down. Get back, all of you. Listen to me, Jerry. Don't try it. Not even you, Mr. McIntyre. I mean it. You crazy little dope. Get away from that door. I'm going out. You try and stop me. I'll kill you. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Gregory Peck in The Truth About Jerry Baxter. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, what does it cost for all that electricity my car uses? Practically nothing, pal, because it's produced, stored, and supplied right under the hood of your Autolite-equipped car by your car's Autolite electrical system. But all those parts, Harlow... All those parts, including the coil, distributor, generator, and the starting motor, work together like a team, Hap, to give you the smoothest performance money can buy. That's why Autolite electrical systems are used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. You've sold me, Harlow. Fine. And friends, insist on Autolite original factory parts when your Autolite-equipped car needs replacements. You can get them at your nearest authorized Autolite service station listed in the classified section of your phone book under Automotive Electrical Service or at the car dealer who sells your make of car, or wherever you see the Autolite original factory parts sign. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage, Mr. Gregory Peck, 
in Elliot Lewis's production of The Truth About Jerry Baxter, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. He got away. And it was all headlined in the afternoon editions. Teenage addict breaks out. For details, see page two. Details. A frightened boy ran away. He didn't want to be locked up for something he said he hadn't done. He had a loaded gun and that was bad. But there was something else that was worse. Any news, Sergeant? No. That kid knows the city is going to be tough. He knows it. San Francisco, too. He was born there. He's got a gun. He's going to try and get narcotics. Maybe not. (laughs) Are you kidding? You want a crazy kid running around loose shooting up the town? No. Sergeant Holly. Where? Uh, uh, Wait a minute. Bannister, get this. Yeah. Yeah, okay, give it to me again. Uh, Right. Be right over. Bannister, got across the bay. We're going over. You coming, Mac? All right. Oh, uh, Holly. They won't shoot, will they? I don't know. We got to get them. We crossed the bridge to San Francisco. A druggist on Market Street had reported that a boy answering Jerry's description had held him up, forced him to hand over a supply of drugs. I stayed with Sergeant Holly because I wanted to be there if they found him. I wanted to find him myself. Night came and we kept on looking. The search always led us to the South City. It was narrowing down as we got calls... And we knew that he must be nearby. Anything in there, Bannister? No, dead end. All right. We'll try the warehouse across the street. Check in the car. See if anything's come in. Okay. Right. He's got friends down here, Holly. There's a million places to hide. Yeah, I know it. I'm just wondering if he told the truth. What do you mean? About that woman. I got him a parole because I believed in him. So? We all make mistakes. Oh, you don't understand. Suppose he wasn't lying. Suppose he did hit your ride, and it was the truth. It's a lot of coincidence, Mac. He's got a record of peddling. He's picked up in a stolen car, dope in the glove compartment. What does that sound like? Yeah, sure. Well, there's another alley around the side. I'll take a look. All right. Be careful. Just yell and run if you see him. All right. Hi, Mr. Mac. Oh, Jerry. I got a gun. Don't you call those cops out there because I'd feel bad if I had to kill you. And I don't want to feel bad. Give me the gun, Jerry. Uh-uh. You know they'll get you. Nobody can get me. Why did you run away? I told you I'd help. You? You'd help? Now, give me the gun, Jerry. I'll stand by you. You trust me, don't you? You didn't believe me when I told you about that dame. You didn't believe me. Well, I know who she is now. A friend told me. She's a friend of a friend. Oh, what's her name? Oh, no, 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 I'm too smart. You know something? I think maybe I'm going up to kill myself a dame. Oh, Jerry, no. Give up. Let the police take care of it. They'll have to believe you now. Have a shot, one of these. Kind of heavy, huh? Kid, come on, come with me. I gotta go get her. Then you believe me. Jerry, let me come with you. Don't go out there alone. Sure. Okay. Don't start anything, Mr. Mac. I don't want to hurt you. You know? I was hoping when we got on the street that Holly or Bannister would be there, but they weren't. Only the prowl car across at the corner, empty. I couldn't take a chance, not only for my own skin, but Jerry's. They'd be shooting. So I walked with him. I wasn't able to get near enough to grab the gun. As we passed under a street lamp, I saw his face, pale and tight. But his eyes were clear. I knew he'd taken none of the stolen narcotics. He hadn't taken it yet. We didn't go far. He stopped at a rundown hotel and, signaling me to walk ahead, went up the back stairs. I remember the smell of that place. 
old and rotten. Uh, 306. How come you want your kind of job, Mr. Mac? You should have been something else, a nice guy like you. Give me the gun, Jerry. Don't do it. Don't be scared. Telegram, miss. Who are you kidding? Go away. Open up or I'll shoot through the door. Okay. What do you want? You. I'm going to talk to you. Hi, Peggy. Hey. You're the I'm kid. I'm the that... kid. Get inside. Mister, are you a cop? This Shut is up. a kid. That... Ah! What a dump. Drop it, Jerry. Drop it. Move over there. You too, mister. Here's the louse pedal the stuff to me, Mr. Mac. Remember? Harry Richards. I told you about him. His wife's a louse, too. Didn't know you were married, Harry. You didn't think you'd get away with it, did you, kid? Business has been bad since you squealed. I had to lay low, and it's cost me plenty. This your wife? Yeah. You sent her out to pick up Jerry and frame him. That's it. Smart little punk to find us. No, dumb. I think I'll kill you too, Harry. Oh, sure you will. I don't know what you're going to do, Richards, but a narcotics rap is better than murder. I'll be safe on both counts. Jerry will be. Hey, Jerry, let him out. You'll kill him. Not him. You, mister. I'm going to shoot you. Stick you both in the closet and put the gun in little Jerry's hand. When he wakes up, he can explain it to all your pals. What about us, Harry? They'll figure something's wrong. You got a better idea? What do I do? Let this guy go and get sent up for life? Oh, we're going to take a long trip. By the time they figure it out, we can be in Mexico anywhere. Now, go on, get packed. Oh, all right. The woman threw things into a suitcase, and Harry Richards leaned against the wall. Didn't take his eyes off me. Jerry groaned once, but didn't come out of it. There was a bad cut on his head where the barrel of the gun had hit him. But then they were ready. He dragged the boy to a closet and put him in. Turned around to me and... All right, mister. Turn around. Turn around, I said. No, thanks. Mr. and Holly down the hall. I tried to talk to the boy. But he was almost out of his mind with fear. Then when I tried to get the gun, he hit me. Oh, it was a long way off, that sound. It faded, then came back. I had to get my head clear before they came in. Jerry had tried to shoot it out with him. Open up. Police. Not locked. Hey, smell something? Cordite. Gun's been fired. Closet. Must be. What do you think? Wait a minute. Wait. Jerry. Come out with your hands up. Come out. <laughs> I can't. I can't stand it anymore. It's killing me. I gotta get out. I gotta do I got to get me out. Get me out. Hey, drop the gun. Quick. Mac. Mac, you okay? Yeah, he didn't do it. Hold it. Grab him. Get away from that window. I'll jump. I'll jump. Don't come near me. I'll jump. Jerry, no. You're not going to put me away. I'll jump. I'll jump. I want to. They'll shut me up and I'll die. No, no, kid, no. You lie. He's not, Jerry. It's the truth. You believe me? They know you didn't do anything. Richards did. So, Mr. McIntyre. Please don't. I'll jump. I'll say I shot you. Jerry, Jerry, listen to me. Don't you see? You're cleared now. I can tell them about Richards. You're all right. Oh, stay away, please. Please. 
Listen, listen, Jerry, listen to me. We're going to take care of you. Not in a cell, no more cells. I give you my word. A hospital where it's clean and quiet. They won't tie you down. You can rest. Listen to me, Jerry, don't take care of you. When you feel better, you can try again. From scratch. That'll be it, won't it, Holly? Won't it? Oh, sure. Sure, kid. We're not lying. That'll be it. Help me, Mr. Mack. You got to help me. Sure, Jerry. Sure. I got you. You're okay now. You'll help me. You believe in me. You will. You'll help me. Oh, please. Please. We took him with us, not to a cell, but to a hospital room where he could get rest and quiet. We caught the Richards that same night at the airport. We caught the Richards. But two days later, I had another youngster to talk to. This time, a 16-year-old girl. Her mother was with her and wouldn't believe it when I showed her the marijuana we'd taken from her daughter. She'd bought it from a friend in school. She told me all about it. And as I listened, I thought of Jerry. And I wondered where it would end. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Gregory Peck. Today, we honor our flag, symbol of American freedom. And on this day, it is appropriate that we also honor an American city, which typifies the heritage of our great country. That city is Detroit, which this year celebrates its 250th anniversary. Since July 24th, 1701, when Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac first set his standard on the shore of Ville de Troyes, Detroit has never ceased to progress. Here was developed our greatest tool, the automobile. And from this arsenal of democracy came many of the sinews of defense, which helped keep our country free through two world conflicts. And as surely as Detroit has achieved in material sense, so has it contributed to international understanding and to the cultural and spiritual life of America. Autolite is proud to have known and worked with the people of Detroit and gladly takes this opportunity to extend to them best wishes on their 250th anniversary of their fine city. Next week on Suspense, Mr. James Mason in another story suggested by Actual Events. The story of a man whose life was more fantastic than any fiction. A story we call The Greatest Thief in the World. Presented on Suspense. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The Truth About Jerry Baxter was written for Suspense by Anthony Ellis from a story by Forrest Barnes and Roxy Roth. In tonight's play, William Tracy was heard as Jerry and John Denner as Sergeant Holly. Featured in the cast were Clayton Post, Joan Banks, Shep Mencken, High Everback, and Joseph Kearns. Gregory Peck will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, Captain Horatio Hornblower. You can buy world-famous Autolite standard-type or resistor-type spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. And remember, next week, Mr. James Mason in a tale we call The Greatest Thief in the World. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.